So, am I understanding you've been studying the book of Matthew? Is that right? Yeah. All right, well, here's a test. We always want to start out with a test, right? What are the four great things that Matthew gives us in the book of Matthew? The great commission. What else is great? What kind of sermon does Matthew reveal to us? Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever, ever preached. What else? What kind of commitment did Matthew reveal that Jesus wants us to have? Greatest commitment, doesn't it? He wants us to give up everything, virtually, to follow him. All right. You all passed. I, as an educator, I, I've never been a fan of traditional testing, multiple choice, fill in the blank, all that kind of stuff. I, I like to do uh, what they call authentic assessment, where you put them in the environment and you have them do what they would actually be doing. And, and I, I rarely ever put on a paper or something like that, fail. I'll put something like needs improvement. But uh, there's always a small part of something that was accurate. Well, good morning. I am Dave Layton. Uh, it, it is an honor to be here. Thank you. It's, it, what a treasure uh, this congregation is offering, not only to the brotherhood, but when you look at the stats through Bible talk with so many people uh, being exposed to God's Word, what a treasure the Choctaw Church, and, and of course, you are the Choctaw congregation, so... Uh, what, what a treasure you're providing to, to the world, and, and it's a great thing. Well, I want to talk this morning, and, and let me move into it because I've got quite a bit of material to cover, uh, spiritual growth, a journey to Christ's likeness. Let me give a shameful plug here. Uh, this is actually based on a uh, publication, a, a book I had published through 21st Century Christian, and uh, in that book, I go into a lot more detail, not, not just what you're a little bit about what you're going to hear this morning, but more detail into that, and also the obstacles that Satan puts up before us and how we overcome those obstacles, obstacles to our spiritual growth. And, and so we'll talk about that. But there's something else that's here. I, I'm an educator by profession. I, I've spent my entire life involved with adult education. Now, it's not been in the traditional sense that one thinks of. Uh, I got into it. In 1980, uh, I had the choice when I was, uh, uh, excuse me, in 19, uh, yeah, 1980. I, my timeline got mixed up a little bit. I was a young senior airman at Little Rock Air Force Base in Arkansas, and I was thinking about reenlisting, and I wanted to become an instructor in my career field, which was communications, at uh, Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls. And so I, I got with the resource advisor for that career field, and I said, I'd like to be an instructor. And he said, there are no openings at Shepherd for senior airmen, and so uh, you, you're, you're not going to uh, be able to do that. He said, but we do need basic training instructors for the Air Force, TI as we call them, training instructor, drill sergeant. And I said, oh, 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 oh I don't think I want to do that. He goes, well, just let me let you know. If you re-enlist, you are number one on the short list to go to Korea on a remote assignment. I said, hut two, three, four, buddy, here I go. I became a basic training instructor, fell in love with it. Not, not the drill sergeant aspect of it, but the idea of being able to, to teach adults. And so that began my career in adult education. I went on and got my master's in adult education, and my emphasis has always been on uh, curriculum design. My doctorate is in religious leadership education. But uh, I, I just enjoy learning, and, and it's just fascinating to me. So that, that's me. Let, me. let me move on. Let's talk about spiritual growth, though. You know, every, every journey, I, I don't, I don't it, it always starts with a first step. You, you, you got to go. And, and, and so that's what we're doing in our spiritual growth. And we're going to be talking about a lot of that uh, how, how do we become Christ-like? That, that's, that's such a goal out there. That's what we're supposed to be doing as, as Christians, to be like Christ. That's what that word means. And, and so that's, it's a journey. 
and, and you'll hear me say it again, it's not something that we achieve in this lifetime. We become more and more like Christ, but we never really fully reach that level. All right, technology, how do I do this? I tap it, right? There we go. I had to touch it just right. Okay. It is a hard habit for me to break to not turn around and look at the slides, so forgive me ahead of time for that. I, as I said, I'm an educator, and every learning situation has three objectives. I want you to know something, feel something, and do something. I want you to understand, as a result of this lesson, the process of spiritual growth. That's this process we go through. And then I also want you to accept the necessity of growing spiritually. Well, first of all, it's a command. And, and so there's a necessity. But it's also a necessity because it prevents us from becoming unfaithful, helps prevent it. It helps keep us faithful, and, and it, it helps us become better servants for the master. So accept it. That's, that's the, what they call the affective domain, how we feel about things. Internalize it. Make it a part of who you are that you want to grow spiritually. And then take the knowledge that God gives us. What a, what a gracious God we serve. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't prevent us from coming to, us, to Him. He invites us to come to Him. Here's the way to come to Him. And here's how you grow. And all of that is a part of it. So take what God has given us and put it in our lives. So that's our learning outcomes for the lesson. Let me move now. I want to read two verses of scriptures related to this, Romans 12, 2, and you're, you're very familiar with these. Uh, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then... The next one is one of my favorites from Peter. These are really, the, I don't know that it was the last thing Peter ever said, but it certainly is uh, the close of his letters to us, last recorded words we have of him. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Uh, I, by the way, I'm reading from the English Standard Version in, in uh, these that I have. But I love that verse, grow in the grace and knowledge. How can we grow in something that God imparts upon us so lavishly? I was taught when you ask a question, you count to four. So that was a question, and there's an anticipation of a response. How do we grow in grace? What are some ways we can do that? Something that God lavishes on us. Y'all going to have to speak up. Practice. Practice it. Yeah, put it into effect. Sure. My answer is to become aware of it more and more in our life. And, and to practice it. Take advantage of it. Use it. So Peter's saying grow in grace. And the knowledge is a part of that as well. So that's... Two underlying verses, there's so many more that talk about uh, what we're doing. I said when I started that every journey starts with a step. you, you got to get started. In, in the handout that I've given you, I've given you some information about a seeker. That's where I want to start. Basically, there's two kind of seekers that are out there. The first kind, and the one that I'm going to address first, is somebody who is... They're seeking God's will in their life. They're, 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 we're going to look at the characteristics of it, but, but it's someone who, who has never really discovered God's love, or it might be someone who has lost their way, uh, that, that has turned away from God, uh, and is seeking that, how do I return? How do I come back? I, I love the, the parable of the prodigal son. He wanted to come home, and, and finally, in a desperation, I, I see him saying, just go home. And he's thinking on the way, I, I, I'll be a servant. I, I, I'll earn my way back. He didn't know how to return. And finally he said, I'm just going to return. 
And, and, and oh, what a gracious Lord we serve. What was the response the, from the father when he saw him from afar? Oh, I'm going to make him work. Was that the response? Oh, yeah, he ran to him, somebody said. Yes. And he didn't, didn't go, go get a bath before you come see me. That boy had the stink of the pigs on him and the dirt of the travel on him and everything else. And his father, what did he do? Threw his arms around him. Put a robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. Sandals on him. It's signifying he's fully returned to the family and all authority and privileges and everything. That's my father. So seekers are in that, that category of, I, I, I don't know who God is. I, something's going on here and then somebody who needs to come back. So that's one category of a seeker, somebody outside. And, and as I've done the research and, and studied this and observations and been a seeker myself, think about that. What, what does a seeker look like? This is important because you are in the family. And you and I, all of us, have been tasked by God, a sacred trust, to teach that seeker, and God will always bring the seeker and the teacher together. That's how it happens. We're going to look in a minute at, at a, some people, but talk to the Ethiopian eunuch about that in, in, in Acts 8. The Lord could have told the Ethiopian what to do. What did he do, though? He sent Philip to him. Talk to Cornelius about that. Sent Peter to him. See, that's how it works. God always brings the seeker and the teacher together, and we've got to be ready. And so it's important to know this. What does a seeker look like? How, how do I know? And then how do I approach that person? That, that's another whole lesson in itself. But uh, the characteristics of a seeker is somebody who says, well, something's not right. I don't, I don't feel right. My life doesn't feel well. Something's out there greater than me. Did you hear the personal pronouns there? A seeker is looking, there's, it's, it's about me at this point. Something's not right. I, I need to get myself right. Don't know what to do. Don't know how. Or I think I know how. I've heard some people talk about it. And, and, and so there's that part of seeking. And it's a dissatisfaction, though, with their situation. That, that's driving them. Uh, they're motivated to change. But how? What? Where? What do I do? And the last point I brought up there is confusion over which direction to take. Oh, man. There is so much confusion out there, especially talking about baptism and salvation and repentance and who is Jesus and all of these kinds of things and what's expected of me if I'm a Christian and misperceptions about what Christianity is all about. So these are, these are the things that are going on inside of a seeker. And what we do is provide them with direction from God's word on how to discover our Lord. So the focus is on self, all of that. Now, as I said, there's a second kind of seeker, and that's you and I. Don't ever, don't ever stop being a seeker. Now, though, our seeking has a purpose, and it has clarity and we're seeking to discover further God's word and put it into effect in our lives and help others as well. You see the difference? The seeker outside of the faith, outside of the body, I don't know what to do. I don't have direction. The seeker inside the faith says, I know what this is about. And I'm discovering more and more every day. And I'm growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm learning what it means to be a citizen in God's kingdom. So that's two different kinds of seekers. The second kind of seeker, as we're going to see, is not confused, <clears throat> is aware of something greater, and knows what that greater is. May be dissatisfied, but hungering and thirsting for more knowledge from our Lord. Motivated to change, absolutely, and understands the direction. I need to, I need to keep going in the direction our Lord wants us to. What makes somebody become a seeker? I'm talking about the one outside of the faith. And, and, and as I go through these three different common reasons why somebody becomes a seeker, somebody's looking to discover our Lord, think about yourself. Probably 
one of these three is going to address your situation, how you came to the Lord, but it's probably a combination of these. The first one is a significant life event. Something happens in someone's life. The longer someone waits to turn to our Lord, the greater likelihood it's going to be a negative event. Something's going to have to jar that person awake. It doesn't have to be. It can be a, a great event. I, I imagine most of you, if not all of you in here that are parents, you, you can empathize with the feelings I had. Our first daughter, we have four daughters, no boys. I told my daughters, who, uh, if the, and, and excuse me, let me back up. I have four daughters, no sons. I have nine granddaughters, no grandsons. I told my daughters, the first one that has a grandson, I'm changing my will. <laughs> they know I have nothing, so... When we brought Jennifer home from the hospital, we brought her home, we put her in the car, you know, strapped her down, got her home, brought her in the house. Now what do I do? Did y'all experience that? <laughs> that was a significant event in our life. It was a great thing. It was wonderful. I loved it. It was great. But I'm sitting there going, I need some help. You know, I, I read the books. I understood but now it's live, it's real. So it can be a good thing, a positive event, birth of a child, a wedding, graduation, uh, promotion, a uh, new job, whatever, memorable events in our life. But as I said, the longer somebody waits, the more likely it's a negative thing. I, I, I've come to realize this past year, maybe two years, because 2020 wasn't such a hot year, was it? Everybody talked about how bad it was. I thought it was a great year. What a year of opportunity we had because so many people were saying, man, I, I, something's going on in my, is that me? We have a ring alarm system in our house. Somebody just either walked by or drove by our house over in Prattville, Alabama. I lost my train of thought. Oh, <laughs> my phone or my iPad chimed at me. All right, so it's been a year of opportunity because of COVID and all the things that were going on in this year. And people are saying, there's something out there. What can I do? And, and we can help guide them. To, yes, there is something bigger and greater out there. It's our Lord. He is in control. You thought you were in control. So, so anyway, uh, but it, it typically is a negative significant event, but it brings them to that understanding. I need to find out all, all that's going on. Um, they show that there's more to life and, and we need something or someone. Just, I, if you are willing to do so, I, I, I don't want to hear the story so much. I'd, I'd love to hear it. I want to hear it later, but not in the class time, but just with a show of hands. Did any of you experience a life event that brought you to the realization, I need, I need the Lord? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Good. You found the way. You're here. Great. All right, so Scripture's full of positive and negative examples of, of significant events. Um, let me give you two of them. The people in Acts 2 uh, at Pentecost, what did they say? Men and brethren, what are we going to do? Now, now, see, sometimes we miss the impact of that. The, the, the Hebrew, the Israelite nation, the people of Israel and, and, and Judaism, they knew firsthand what happens when you go against God's will. Talk to them about the Babylonian captivity. Talk to them about being under Roman uh, oppression and, and all of this. They knew when, when God punishes, God punishes. And, and so here they had not only rejected the Son of God, they had killed the Son of God. So that statement, men and brethren, what are we going to do, was really a, a cry of desperation. Men and brethren, what are we going to do? We, we missed that a little bit. That was a significant emotional event in their life. And what did they do? Men and brethren, what are we going to do? Peter told them, see, God brings the seeker together. The other one, to me, the most common example of a significant emotional event in somebody's life bringing them to the Lord is Paul. You know, you know what happened there uh, in, in Acts 9. Uh, who are you, Lord? 
I, I, I love it. As, as, as Paul then goes on to Damascus again, he's, he's still blinded by the event and probably, oh, I know, he, he's, he's still got the road on him and, you know, falling in the dirt, all that. And, and, and he, the, the narrative goes on. Jesus appears to Ananias there and the vision says, I need you to go to Damascus. I need you to see this guy named Saul. The narrative says, for he is praying Man, like never before. Saul was not reciting some liturgical prayer he had learned as a Pharisee from the old law. I see Paul, Saul, flat out on his face, hands spread eagle. He is, he is crying out to the Lord. He's praying like never before. What was the answer to the prayer? God brought the seeker and the teacher together. Be prepared. Somebody out there is praying you might be the teacher. Be prepared. And you don't have to know everything, but you do need to know who Jesus is, and you need to say, let me tell you about my friend Jesus. Tell the story of Jesus. So that's a significant emotional event there, those two. Now, fortunately, not every seeker <clears throat> has to go through a significant event. There's also just a general feeling of insufficiency. You, you get to the point where it's like, I, there's just got to be something there. There's more to life than this. Or I'm starting to kind of get on the second half of life. And I, is there something else? And they begin to look around and, and feel this feeling of insufficiency. Or they're looking at what is different about that person? Why is that person rejoicing? Why do they have joy in their life? And I don't have that. I've got all this stuff. I'm rich and famous and good looking and all that other kind of stuff. It's not enough. So that feeling of insufficiency brings somebody to become a seeker. That, that's one of the characteristics of a seeker, if you'll remember. Feeling of inadequacy in their life. So for many, this is a realization that occurs when uh, it, it kind of comes over time. By the way, when they do come to that realization, it might lead to a significant emotional event internally in that person. So there might be a blending of these things. But it leads them to recognize a need to begin the journey in some way. And we need to be there. God wants us there. Uh, excellent example. I've already mentioned in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian official, he not only shows his desire to know more about God, but there's also the positive response once it's discovered. Uh, so it's likely that I think most of us fit into this situation where uh, over a period of time, you know, there's just that understanding. There's something else out there, and, and we go for it. Uh, so as a result, uh, people will respond just as the Ethiopian official did. They begin their life as a disciple of the Lord. Uh, similar to the situation of the Ethiopian official is someone's brought to the realization of a need of salvation. My favorite example of this is Cornelius. I love the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. When I teach somebody the gospel as a sojourner, when we go out and, and do door knocking or we set up Bible studies, I like to tell people the story of Cornelius. That fits so many people's lives. Somebody said, well, I'm not a Roman official. I'm not a military official. Yeah, but you're a pretty good person. You're not a bad person. You, you, you probably are a believer in God. And, and so there's commonalities there that we can share with Cornelius. And then we can say, but look what happened in Cornelius' life and what the result of that was and how that fits into their life. So I like to tell the story of Cornelius. And by the way, that's what I do. I tell the story of Cornelius. I don't open the Bible necessarily and start reading it. You know the story of Cornelius and, and, and all that happened there. And, and so then, though, I have that Bible open, and when I get to that last part of Acts chapter 10 about I asked them to read it. Cornelius and his household were baptized. So anyway, Acts chapter 10 is a great example. A Roman centurion, military officer, he's uh, in, introduced to us as being a devout man there in verse 2 of Acts chapter 10. He's described as a devout man, a, devout man, a God-fearing man. Uh, but, but he needed to come to a clearer understanding of God's will. He didn't have it. What happened? It says he was praying. The answer to the prayer. 
Go send for Peter. He's going to tell you what you need to do. He sends for Peter. Peter didn't understand what's going on here. He had the vision of the sheet being lowered with the animals in it. Finally, the servants arrive and Peter understands, okay. And he goes with them the next day. And uh, I, I love the part two, Cornelius bows down before him and Peter says, get up, get up. I'm, I'm just a man. I'm just Peter. Yeah, really, just Peter? <laughs> so uh, he didn't understand what was going on. Uh, he didn't even, con I'm talking about Cornelius, he didn't even consider himself a seeker. We don't know what the prayer was that Cornelius was offering, but the answer to that prayer was the seeker and the teacher came together. Now, uh, we know what happened as a result of that. Um, uh, Peter uh, told him about our Lord. He saw the Holy Spirit coming on the Gentiles, uh, the non-Jews. The non uh, they believed they were baptized. So there we have somebody who was brought to the understanding of what they needed to do. They were, I, I, I have always understood Cornelius was pretty well satisfied with his life. Successful person, God fear, giving alms, God considering him righteous, all of those things. We need, we need a lot of folks like that. But God knew who he was and God knew what he needed and he brought the seeker and the teacher together. So again, how does somebody come to the understanding they need the Lord. These three ways are, or a combination of these are, are ways that I see people being brought to the Lord. A significant event wakes them up or points out to them a feeling of insufficiency or one of us uh, helps that person understand that uh, they need salvation in their life and guides them in that direction. Now, on that handout I gave you, this is the spiritual growth continuum. A continuum is a fancy word that simply says it shows a relationship of events over a span of something, time usually. If you'll notice on that handout, I have seeker outside of it. Again, that's that person who's not in that relationship with the Lord. I also said that you're a seeker even if you're inside the continuum. You're growing spiritually. That's a... I, I, I want to point out a couple of things here. Just for the purposes of illustration, one could certainly make a great point, and I don't disagree, that if I'm outside of the relationship with the Lord, but I begin to seek the Lord, that that is a growth, a, a spiritual growth. I, sure, but for the purposes of illustration, I'm trying to draw the distinction between the two. That person is outside of that relationship with the Lord. Inside that relationship with the Lord, we're a different kind of seeker. And I want to point out something else. Extremely important, and praise God for this. I put down there on that slide, initial point of salvation. You are in the family. Praise God for that. If God chose that moment to call you home, you are in the family. What a joy that is, knowing that. But when you have a new child coming to your family, do you want them to stay that way? No. What do you want them to do? You want them to grow and develop. Isn't there joy in seeing our children grow and develop and become people of their own and contributors to society and, and all of the great things that are associated with, with a good, positive maturity? What a joy that is. It's the same thing in our Christian family membership. God wants us to grow and develop in the knowledge and, and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Makes us a better servant. Makes us able to serve the Father better. Strengthens us against Satan's uh, attacks upon us. So all of those things are there. But we're in the family. That is so important. And as one begins their journey towards spiritual growth, we're going to see how that increases. Now, I've given you a little bit of room on, on your, um, what time do we stop? Ten minutes? Oh, man. Oh, okay. Let's start out realizing Christ. That's, that's the first stage, realizing Christ. I'm a new, get your water-cooled pins out. We're fixing to hit the ground running. Realizing Christ. I, 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 I now, oh, I'm sorry, i got to show something extremely important here. 
And I'm going to walk up to the stage to show you this. I, I want you to understand this about the continuum. You notice what I've drawn here? I've got at the very top this large section up here. As a new Christian, it's all about me. You're still learning, like a baby, right? It's all about the baby, isn't it? But notice what happens. As we grow spiritually, the top quadrant area, more and more about me, becomes less and less about me. Until finally, it's all about the Lord. We don't reach it, but we get there. I've also drawn that as a straight line. I know you know better than that. I, I, I praise God for 1 John chapter 1. If we're walking in the light as He is in the light. Because we go up and down and sometimes backwards and in circles. But is the general trajectory of our life showing spiritual growth? That's what God wants for us. My brother-in-law made the statement and I've stolen it from him. <clears throat> uh, seriously, I, I, first time my brother-in-law Larry said this, it's like, man, that is great stuff. He said, God does not demand perfection, but he does demand faithfulness. And that's what he rewards. And so that's what we see here. I'm drawing that line just to show our growth needs to be going up in that direction. So realizing Christ is where we start. Now, just like there are characteristics of a seeker, here's the characteristics of somebody who's in that first growth phase of realizing Christ. See how much of this you remember. I hope you're beyond it now. <clears throat> learning about Jesus. Very, very dear friend of mine, Barbara Ann Spears, was a colleague of mine when, when I was... Uh, working with the two-year college system in Alabama. Barbara was director of uh, academic programs. I was director of career and technical education. But Barbara Ann had become a seeker. Now, in her mind, she was saved. She wasn't there yet, understanding what Scripture teaches. But I asked her one time, I said, Barbara Ann, have you ever thought what eternity is like? And she started to cry, and I said, I thought, oh no, what did I, what did I say? I said, Barbara, what's going on? And she said, Dave, I, I, I'm so busy trying to figure out who Jesus is. I, I, don't, I hadn't even had time to think about eternity. And I thought, man, what an insight that is. Does a child know or understand time? Not really. I remember as a little boy, a teenager was a grown-up adult in my life. Wow. Even a, somebody a year or two older than me was. So, so again, the characteristics of somebody who's realizing Christ, they're just learning more and more about our Lord. Think about this as the teacher now. If you've got somebody who's realizing Christ, what is your role as a teacher to help guide that person to spiritual maturity? You don't want to throw them into a class on Revelation right off the bat. They'll get there, but they're still trying to figure out who Jesus is. And what it's about. What, 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 this choice I've made, what does it mean to be a Christian? Uh, being committed. But I'm kind of apprehensive about it. Yeah, okay, I did the right thing. My, Mike baptized me and, and he told me I was now a Christian. Welcome to the family. What does that mean? See, I'm still learning. I accept it, but haven't internalized it yet. Learning Christ-like behaviors and attitudes. Somebody comes to us as a babe in Christ they're coming out of a lifetime of whatever. You, you know one of the hardest things to do is to unlearn something. Be patient with them. Love them. Accept them. Don't, don't have to agree with everything and you want to move them out of things. But it's where they are. You've got to let them grow and help them grow. So learn, learning Christ-like behaviors and attitudes. What's it like to be a Christian? I don't know. I have this misconception still. Uh, limited awareness of my role in eternity uh, as an eternal being. Okay, you told me I'm saved and I'm going to live forever. <laughs> I'm going to put that aside for right now. I have no idea what that means. Can't even figure it out. I'm not even going to worry about it. And then there's, there, might be, there might be a willingness to, to show Jesus. We see that. People are willing to show uh, uh, the, what, what they've now discovered about Jesus. Not by myself. Go with me, help me, give me some answers. I don't know it yet. So that's realizing Christ. Let's go to the second one now. Now I begin to grow and develop. I begin to, to 
get a grasp on what's going on. My awareness is growing. And I now blend into some, now there may be some back and forth. These are not exact, but as we grow, you see more and more of these characteristics. It's, it's making behaviors and attitudes that I've learned. I make it a better or greater part of my life. I now understand, see, there's a difference between just knowing about something and then growing in that understanding. And, and, and so I'm, I'm making those a greater part of my life. I, I see the need for them. I recognize the value of them. And it's who I want to become. They're Christ-like characteristics. I want to be like Christ. There's a desire to learn more and more about Jesus. Oh, yeah. The more we grow mature in our spiritual work, the more we want to be like our Savior. Just can't help it. And then there's, there's the developing awareness of my role in eternity. Oh, wait a minute. I, I am saved. I was telling somebody the other day, we were, I don't remember what the conversation necessarily was about, but it was, uh, but we were, the, I, I was baptized right after morning services uh, back in uh, 1973. And uh, I, I remember that night I came back to services and the invitation song was Amazing Grace. And I remember thinking, I've done it. Wait a minute. I, I don't have to worry about responding. See, so there's that developing awareness there uh, of my role in eternity. And as we grow and understand more about we are becoming spiritual beings, none of us fully understand eternity, but we begin to see our role. What is your role, by the way? What is your role? I've already said it several times. Why did God create us? What are we doing? What are we called? Servants. What a joy it's going to be to serve the Father forever. Man, I got goosebumps thinking about that. And then there is that desire to show Jesus. Originally I said there's that willingness to show our Lord. Now we're moving into I have a desire to show the Lord. The willingness becomes stronger. <clears throat> those, are, those, again, are characteristics. By the way, this is, this is somebody in the kingdom. Keep that in mind. Not enough time. All right, now we're getting into characteristics of being like Christ. Oh, this is, this is, this is when it, oh, this is when it really gets there. And by the way, in, 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 a, in a positive way, it feeds on itself. It strengthens, and it's a positive cycle that we go through. Characteristics. Do you know people? I know you do. Do you know people that you look at them and say, man, that's the model of Christianity right there. That person is like Christ. I see it a lot. Oh, wonderful people that we see. So we're seeing. When somebody sees us, they see Christ. That's what we strive for. By the way, characterization, that phrase characterization, is the highest level of learning when, when we become what it is that we're learning. So it's seen as Christ-like in our behavior and our attitudes. Everything in our life we view from the perspective of our Lord's teachings. I'm confident in my salvation. Am I saved? Yes, I am. Praise God. I don't have to worry about that. Not only did that preacher or whoever baptized me tell me that, I've come to realize it through my study and acceptance of God's Word. I'm saved. I, I, I'm there. And I don't even have to worry about my role in eternity. God's got that. Now He's given me the charge to serve, to teach, and given me opportunity to do so, and I'm looking for that. That's that last one, an overwhelming desire to show Jesus to others. You're at the local grocery store, Walmart, whatever, and somebody strikes up a conversation with you. Hi, my name's Dave Layton. Let me tell you about my friend Jesus. Now, they're going to think you're crazy. But if you did that and they learned about Jesus, someday in the eternity they're going to say, Thank you! You wouldn't necessarily be that abrupt with it, but you're looking for a way to steer that conversation in that direction. Especially if you understand that it's a seeker and they're going through a significant event in their life or they're looking for something greater. You're looking for that opportunity. It's just an overwhelming desire to show Jesus to others. That's, again, that's the continuum. 
That's, that's where we want to get to. None of us are fully there, but we're getting there. Am I over time? Real quick. I heard a bell. I, I said this is when it gets great. I love Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait, on, uh, wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Soaring with the eagles. That's what happens in your life when you reach into that level where you're more and more Christ-like. The fetters are gone. The fear is gone. The confidence is there. And the knowledge is there. And you can, man, get out of my way. And you're strong. And you're serving the master. All right, so we go from what in the world is going on to I got this, or better yet, <laughs> Father's got this. All right, let me, let me, let me summarize or, or get to the end. I don't ever want to see that. I promise you, I guarantee it, and you know it, from the moment you even begin to think about turning to the Lord, Satan's going to throw obstacles in your way. And the greatest obstacle is self. I am, I am out of time, so I'm not going to read it. But in Romans 8, 31 through 39, Paul teaches us there. First he says, who can be against us if the Lord's for us? And then he goes on talking about nothing is going to separate us from the love of God. But there's one thing that Paul leaves out of that narrative that will separate you from the love of God, and that's the greatest obstacle in itself. We get in the way. We depart from the Lord. We turn away from the Lord. Not the Lord turns away from us. Prodigal son, perfect example of that. All right, let me, let me summarize. Uh, spiritual growth begins with our choice to be like God. Christ. I choose to be like Christ. What a great gift choice is. It's, it's, it begins when we decide we're going to be in and like Christ. And then we begin that transformation process and we grow and we develop. And, and by the way, another benefit of moving up that continuum is if we do get sidetracked, it's easier to get back on track and it's and it's less likely we're going to get off track. The lower we are in our continuum of development, the more susceptible we are to attacks. So get to growing. That's the point. And, and it helps us overcome barriers. It helps us get back into where we need to be. Don't be discouraged if you feel that you're not where you should be spiritually. It's part of the growth process. And, and study and learn God's word. Uh, so, so don't be discouraged. Don't think it's too difficult. God makes it a way for us. And as I said, you're in the family. And God gives us different capacities to grow and learn and to become who we need to be. Listen, I, I really, really appreciate your time. Uh, usually this presentation goes for about uh, four hours. Um, seriously, it's, it's, a, it's a workshop that I do for sojourners. And, and we, we talk about, well, how can I grow? We'll get into a lot of more detail about that. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate it very, very much. My sermon will be shorter. <laughs>